Hey, how y'all doing? This is Mongo Slade, and today we're going to talk about AEW Dynamite between December the 16th, 2020. So we start this, we start the show with Hangman Page plus the Dark Order, uh, Alex Reynolds and John Silver versus Matt Hardy and Private Party. So let's take a couple of seconds to talk about this thing real, real quick. For starters, when did the Dark Order become baby faces? When did Private Party become heels? Um, why does Mark Quinn have Fruit Loop hair? Why does he have a gigantic gap in his scalp that looks like you can drive a car through it? Um, I like that they changed their gear. Private Party changed their gear. They're no longer looking like goofy fucks. They actually look like, you know, pretty decent. You know, it's an improvement. I'm going to give them points for improving. But then you had the Dark Order. They're dressing like Hangman Page except wearing the Dark Order colors, like purple and black. I was just like, the start of the show, by the way, it was the start of the show. I, I, I look, man, I'm going to be, I'm going to be honest with you. I give zero fucks about Dark Order, period. I just don't care. I have not cared about the Dark Order in months. I am not one of those people that has been won over by their charm or the athleticism of this dwarf, John Silver. He's four foot fucking six. He has no business being in these matches. I don't care if you think he's charismatic. He's a garden gnome. Fuck him. Okay, let's get some real fucking wrestlers in here. I'm sure you have some somewhere hidden on this fucking roster somewhere. Okay. As a match itself, it wasn't it wasn't terrible. It was a little long, but it wasn't terrible. Um, I don't like that you had uh, Hangman Page essentially ensconced in this fucking comedy shit where John Silver is riding him like a horse going yeehaw on his back and whipping his arms around like man just imagine if this shit was going on in Stanford like you really had Brian Alvarez throw a bitch fit because Keith Lee showed up and flipped a coin right hangman page is being ridden like a hobby horse and nobody's going to say anything nobody has anything to fucking say it's cool that you have a guy what a matter of fact let's take a moment because of Hangman Page, Kip Sabian, who was the other? Joey Janela, uh, uh, what's that other kid? Uh, Jungle Boy, Darby Allen. When, when, around this time last year, when AEW started, these were the guys that they swore up and down were going to be the stars of the show. Are we going to focus on young guys? Of all of those guys, the only one that's gotten any real push is, well, I guess you could say Hangman been pushed. He was the tag team champion for a long time. Is Darby Allen? Darby Allen and Hangman Page, that's it. And then it's not even consistent because then you had a long stretch of time when Darby Allen wasn't on TV. And now you have a long stretch of time where Hangman isn't doing anything interesting. So, like, I'm really, I'm really perturbed at this. And maybe they are going to go into this whole Hangman, Matt, Matt Hardy thing. Maybe. And that's something, at least. At least it's something. And, you know, a lot of people, now that I put my thought, put my, put my brain on it, I don't think the private party are turning heel. I think Matt Hardy is a heel, um, but they're still his protégés. So he's, they're just kind of along for the ride. And maybe the Dark Order aren't heels, but how are half the Dark Order heels and the other half baby faces? Because John Silver acts like a baby face and Alex Reynolds does too. And then let's take a, let's take on a sag since I meant saved that name three times already. Alex Reynolds coming out talking about, well, I didn't have a concussion. Oh, then get, you need to get a fucking Oscar because you look like a dead man to me when you were laid out in the middle of the ring. This is the guy who says, well, I didn't have a concussion. Th those spots were planned. It was planned for you to look like a corpse in the middle of the ring for like four minutes. That was the plan. <sighs> man, AEW, man, they play too much. I'm not stupid. You play too much. Anyway, um, Matt Hardy peeled Annex Reynolds after the gin and juice, which is the finisher for the private party. And the reason why I say private party probably are not turning heel is because they seemed a little bit miffed that, you know, Matt tagged himself in just to get the pin. So that means that Adam Page lost a match because he's fooling around with the Dark Order. Whatever. Look, I, I'm I'm detached I'm, a, I'm asking questions. I'm just asking questions. Why are we doing this to this guy? Just imagine if this was Stanford. 
Just imagine. Just imagine if this stuff was going on in Stanford, bro. That you had this guy that you told the world was going to be a superstar on your first day. Oh, we Hangman Page, we're going to make a star out of him. Really? You turned him into a goddamn drunk, kicked him out of the elite. Now you've mired him with fucking Matt Hardy and the, the Dark Order. <laughs> if that's a star, I don't know what to tell you. Um, and I, it's hard to tell who's the baby face and who's the heels anymore because nobody talks. Uh, Matt Hardy talks. Matt Hardy is a heel. I don't know a private party or heel with baby faces. I can only look at the body language and tell that they probably faces who don't know Matt Hardy is a heel. But the Dark Order are certainly faces. But when did the Dark, how are the Dark Order faces? And they're feuding with Dustin Rhodes, who is a face. And they're also acting, jumping up on other people who are faces. Look, I'm asking too many questions. I'm, 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 I'm really trying. I'm trying too hard. I spent six minutes on this first match. Fuck this match. So the next uh, segment was MJF being honored by the New York Times for best performance of 2020 for La Dinner Debonair. Jericho tried to take uh, credit for it, but MJF downplayed his his input and then said, well, then later said, I couldn't do it without you. And that he loved the inner circle and that, you know, um, he couldn't have done it without any one of them. And he felt like the New York Times disrespected Jericho by saying that he was better than him, which Jericho was, you know, was, was OK with that. Uh, I don't care about this. This is just, you know, them looking for validation. I don't care. Uh, moving to, on to the vignette for Cody and Brandy announcing that they're going to have a baby. Now, I smiled at this. This is leg a legitimate thing that brought a smile to my face. I am always glad when people are going to have babies. That's awesome shit, man. Congratulations to Cody and Brandy. Now, there is the asshole smart within me that says, Hmm, how convenient that after John Moxley and, and Renee come out being pregnant, Brandy has to get pregnant too. You know, all these years of of not getting pregnant. Now all of a sudden, as soon as, you know, your top baby face has gotten pregnant, all of a sudden Cody has to get a, a, a <laughs> Cody has to get a, he has to be a daddy too. You know, got to have some spotlight back on you, but that's just me being an asshole. And it's also complete jokes. I am happy for Brandy and Cody. That's awesome shit, man. Um, hope the kid is happy and healthy. And anything that gets Brandy off my TV is good. And I, I legit mean that. You know, as long as she disappears, everything's going to be good. But of course, this means that the, the, whatever they were doing with Shaq is over with, right? Because Shaq wasn't mentioned, as far as I know. Neither was Snoop Dogg, who was supposed to be on this show. Neither one of those people were, missing, was, were mentioned. Because I, I was told Snoop Dogg was going to be here. Now, imagine... You know, you're in that 18 to 34 demographic. What do you know Snoop Dogg for if you're 18? Drop it like it's hot. You weren't around for gin and juice. So what the hell, what the hell you know Snoop Dogg for? Murder was the case. You're a little too young for that. Well, well, if you're 18, you are. If you're 34, then you're not. You probably were a kid, but, you know, you probably remember it. I don't understand the how Snoop Dogg is in the demographic, other than because he's a rapper. And rappers are, are in the demographic, I guess. They also put their dog on baby security, which I thought was cute. So uh, Cody Rose wrestled in Hadley Cole and Hadley Cole put Cody in the death roll, which was pretty cool. Otherwise, it was a bland as fuck match that we all knew Cody was going to win. And he won with the Cody cutter, which is a springboard cutter from the top rope. I don't know why he has a springboard cutter from the top rope. Like, bro, you know, Randy Orton just and you know, Randy Orton, you know, Diamond Dallas Page just used the diamond cutter. I, 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 why you have to jump from the top rope? I have no idea. Just use the diamond cutter. Like, uh, yeah, just, you know, Randy Orton, just do the RKO dog. If you need to have a secondary finisher, just use the RKO. It's better than the crossroads anyway. Um, anyway, um, a, a helico is okay, but whatever. The Taz appears to congratulate Cody on fatherhood. And, you know, Starks says like Starks, who is amazing, by the way, says that he didn't get any congratulations when he and Cage sunned Darby Allen and Cody a month ago. <laughs> that was really good. And then they, of course, threatened that he was going to go beat up Cody again. And then Sting comes out. And it's Sting! It's Sting! So, uh, Shivani yells out to this Sting. Powerhouse Hobbs wants him a piece of Sting. 
and he has to be held back by Team Taz and Sting pulls out the baseball bat. To keep him at bay, Sting says nothing. Sting does nothing. He just comes out. It snows. The, the heels back down. Sting goes away. So all Sting has done is protect Cody. I'm guessing Sting is going to be the father, the grand, the godfather. Maybe not the actual father. I don't know, but I don't know if his, his fish can still swim. But uh, he's going to be like the godfather of Cody's baby. Um, you know, the, <laughs> the godson of the stinger. Um, but, you know, I'm I'm cool with that. You know, like, I, this Sting stuff, man, I, it's already run its course with me. And I'm pretty sure a lot of other people, it's already run its course with them, too. Uh, I did see some people like, is that all this thing is going to do is just come out, look and walk away. It's like, well, that's all he's being paid to do, dog. <laughs> like Sting's gimmick has sort of been, he's the guy that writes the wrongs. He's the, the conquering hero. Now he's a little bit aging now, but he's the conquering hero. They need, they need to write like a, what was that movie for, uh, Glenn East? Not, was it not Glenn Eastwood? What the fuck is his name? Uh, Eastwood, Eastwood, Clint Eastwood. The, uh, what was the movie? Grand Torino. They need to write like a Grand Torino for for Sting. Like that's what you that's what you need. You need like a, 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 a like a Sting, not a bitter get off my lawn Sting, but like Sting who sees something that is so vile and so disgusting that it, he has to you know pick up his rickety old body and go out there and die. You know, not literally die. But go out there and, and punch, try to punch above his weight against these young guys, these young punks, and trying to stop them. And I think that the only way you could do that is with the Dark Order. Not the Dark Order, goddammit. I, I don't know why that came out of my mouth. I don't want to see Sting anywhere near the Dark Order. I meant the Inner Circle. That you, Well, even though, you know, Jericho's no spring chicken. But if you have Jericho, like, you know, six on one, seven on one, they're beating the hell out of some guy, and then Sting shows up. And... You know, he tries to save this guy. And Jericho's like, Sting, get out of here. Leave me alone, Sting. And then Sting tries to fight all of them by himself and gets beaten down. And is what is, in some ways, a humiliating moment. And other baby faces are trying to help him. And they're getting beat back. And Sting's just, like, trying his best. You know, he's 60 years old. You know? And he's trying to be the conquering hero, but he can't do it anymore. So now he tries to create his own army. You know, he has a sting army of people who like paint their face like sting or, you know, in that same vein. I'm, I'm going too far with this sting. They're not doing anything with sting. OK, he just exists as somebody that people are supposed to click their channel, click the remote to, to watch on TV. And eventually people will get tired of that. People are eventually going to get tired of, oh, you told me sting was going to be on here. He was on here for three for 30 seconds. And that was it. And they're going to move on. But here's what really pissed me off. If I wasn't mad enough, if it didn't seem like I was angry, the Miro promo, because he was wearing a, I believe it was a coat that had, that would look like strobe lights where it had like a hundred colors on it. And I believe it, the, what was that dweeb's name? Uh, Alex Marvez was like Miro. You beat up three of our security guards. What are you going to do? The, the AEW executive committee or whatever finds you $75,000 for attacking three security guys. And then and he said, what is your problem with Orange Cassidy? So I'm waiting on this pretty simple Orange Cassidy keep fucking with him, right? He says his problem with Orange Cassidy is that Orange Cassidy doesn't care about likes, you know, subscriptions or anything like that. And I just literally, I literally turned my TV off. I turned my TV off. I turned it back on. I rewound it to hear it again. And he literally said he doesn't, he doesn't like him because the guy doesn't care about likes or subscriptions or money or anything like that. I was like, this, this cannot be real. You couldn't come up with a real reason for these guys to be feuding. He, he, you know what would have been better if he'd have just said literally anything else. If he literally would have just said, "I don't like Orange Cassidy because I don't like his face," or "I don't like his chest," or somebody like him has no business being in the ring with somebody like me. I'm a fighter. 
I may I dress fly because I am fly, but I'm a fighter underneath all this glitter and this fucking hair dye. I'm a fighter. What is he? He's a skinny chump. Okay. That would have been infinitely better than, well, he doesn't care about likes or subscriptions. And I'm just kind of like, man, you know what? <sighs> he doesn't care. He's pulling the Kevin Nash. He is a guy who's just showing up to work, dog. He's phoning it in. He's phoning it in. And everybody knows that. So he also says that that $75,000, he feels like it's, a, it's money that Orange Cassidy owes him. And then he kind of, you know, whizzes past the actual feud to talk about a stupid segment. So he says, oh, I'm going to have a match with Sonny Kiss on Dark next week. I'm like, you're promoting a match on Dark? Oh, Lord. But then he says, we're going to have a wedding date announcement on Dynamite. So I says to myself, the wedding date announcement is more important than your match. Now, let's 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 do this because I did see this again. Let's 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 sit back in our armchairs, you know, in our rocking chairs and dream and imagine if this was Stanford. And we can say because literally it did happen. Keith Lee wrestled on main event. Keith Lee wrestled Andrew Garza on main event. I didn't see it. I don't think it's up on the network yet. But this is what people have said. Congratulations. Look at what they're doing to Keith Lee. They're killing him. He's wrestling for free on main events. You're going to have Miro, who you're no, who no doubt is making more money than Keith Lee and comes in off of with the most sympathy that a wrestler could have because he just came off a cuck angle. And you come in and you give him a video game nerd storyline, a wedding storyline. You pair him up. With Orange Cassidy, you don't even have them. You don't even have the match between the two of them. You have them wrestling an Exotico on a YouTube show. There are people out there who are smart, and they have noticed that the way that Miro is being used is abysmal. But there are a lot of people out there, a lot, who are ignoring this. This is some of the worst booking. I have literally ever seen. This is, if you want to say WWE is bad at booking, and sometimes they are, this is WWE level booking. He does not look like a star. He does not like a physical threat. He does not look intimidating. He doesn't look like, doesn't look like anything. He doesn't like a top free agent that just jumped over. Like, this is WCW level stuff. This is WCW level stuff. This is, TNA would have done it better. Cause at least in TNA, he would have gotten a good run. You know, he would have got a, he would have got like a month or two out of that, out of that, that initial coming to TNA. He would have got like a month or two out of it. Maybe even a main event. Cause Christian got a main event out of it. Hell, Rhino did. Rhino got a fucking title out of it. You know, guys used to skip from TNA and get good runs. They weren't sustained in like for years and years all the time. Some of them did something, you know, Jeff Hardy or, you know, Ken Anderson or something like that, but most of them didn't. But in AEW, you burn out in three weeks, four weeks. You're basically on the back burner. Like, where's Brody Lee? <laughs> Look at Matt Hardy was in the first match. This guy came into the company heavily touted. Matt Hardy, what happened to Matt Cardona? WWE wasted him for 10 years or whatever. He was in AEW for three weeks. Like, bro, I don't want to hear no more about WWE can't book. If you're not, if I don't hear anybody complaining about this, and you know what? To be quite honest, I don't, I don't expect it. There are paid propagandists for AEW. Or if they're not paid, then they're doing it for free. You know, what's the difference between a whore and a slut? You know, a whore gets paid. That's the difference. So either these people, these wrestling observer newsletter guys, either they're, Sluts or they're whores. Either way it go, either they're doing this, even they're being propaganda for free, or they're being propaganda and they're getting paid. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that you know they get free tickets to the to the boat cruise, so maybe that's payment. Anyway, it seems definitely unfit. Un, it's like some bullshit. It's bullshit. So <sighs> Eddie Kingston comes out next. Uh, 
Eddie Kingston comes out to quote unquote address his enemies. And his number one enemy is the big guy upstairs. He's enemies with God. Is he is he enemies with God? And he says, Big guy, I'm not dead yet. I just I shook I scratched my head on that one, dog. Like you would think somebody like Eddie King I'm pretty sure I saw Eddie Kingston kind of do religious stuff before. Where he like he, you know, um did like the rosary on his body and stuff like that or something like that. I'm kind of I'm 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 weirded out by this, you know. I'm not a Christian, but I'm just I'm weirded out by people who go out of their way to to offend people of any stripe. That's why I say like I'm not for um uh, people being virtue signaling or for people who are out here trying to uh play it filter, you know, going out your way to offend people. Um, I don't know what he was trying to say here. Maybe he meets a big guy upstairs like Tony Khan. Uh, that's entirely possible. But I would find that to be real bizarre because, you know, they, he looked straight up into the air and there is no uh, there is no ceiling on Daly's place as far as I know. So I, was, I assumed he was talking about God. Then he talked about Pac. He said, he we hurt his neck. His career is over. Now, when you say that, like, oh, yeah. I guarantee you his career is over. And then you knew Pac was coming. And then he said Lance Archer. And the moment he said Lance Archer's name, Lance Archer came out there to beat him up. And then the fam came out to make the save, which is the butcher and the blade. And then Pentagon and Phoenix came out. <clears throat> and then Pac appeared. Then there was a big fight in which the baby faces outnumbered the heels four to three. What? Let me say that again. There were four baby faces, only three heels. Lance Archer, right? Pac, Phoenix, Pentagon. Three heels. K Kingston, Butcher, Blade. And I guess you want to count the bunny, but she wasn't, she's not a combatant. So there was a big fight. Uh, then Lance Archer and Pac started to argue about who gets to beat up Kingston. And then Kingston slipped away. So I was. I just kind of, I shrugged, you know, I was like, okay, what can you do? Eddie Kingston can talk, but now that his storyline with, 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 with John Moxley is over, he's kind of at a crossroads where he still has some, he can always just talk himself back into getting some heat. So he's fine there. Um, but they seem to have really no real plan because who is he? Like, I mean, whatever. And then Lance Archer. Which is actually the bigger problem than what you're going to do with Eddie Kingston. And where is this whole Butcher and the Blade thing going? At least I'm, I'm glad he's there with them because Butcher and the Blade, I don't expect them to talk. So I'm glad Eddie Kingston is there with them. He makes them bearable. But what are you going to do with Lance Archer? Where or where are you going to do with Lance? Remember when Lance Archer was highly touted? He came in from New Japan, red hot. Oh, he was going to have all these great matches with Moxley. He's going to be a big star and... This is a real get for new for AEW. He was going to be a real star. Then what happened? Talk about bad booking one on one dog. You 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 fed him to Cody, then you fed him to Moxley. Now what? Now you got nothing. Now you got nothing. There was no plan B, or no plan C. There was no plan outside of the initial push. There was no plan. So. I don't know what to tell you, man. And you know what? I could give you some examples of what you could do with Lance Archer. But why? They should have to pay me for that. You know, fuck, fuck this. And I don't care that much about Lance Archer anyway. It's just they they brought in these, all these guys debuted within 2020. Matt Hardy, Miro, Lance Archer, Sting. All these guys were brought in in 2020. You know, like I said, they they had all these guys from last year, from 2019, that they told us was going to be big stars. Hangman Page, Darby Allin, Jungle Boy, um, all these guys were going to be big stars. None of them became big stars. Only Darby Allin got over, and MJF got over. I keep forgetting about him. But yeah, Sammy Guevara didn't really get over. Santana and Ortiz really didn't get over. Orange Cassidy did. You know, Orange Cassidy got over. Um, Pac, not really, because he was <laughs> he they weren't really doing that much with him. You know, like who really, really, really got over MJF and Darby, I guess you can't headline a show with either one of them. 
even though they tried to headline shows with MJF. So, so now you look at their those were, those were your 2019 draft picks. Now your 2020 draft picks were people who had extensive, you know, experience. People who were angry from Stanford, you know, the, from people from from New York. Your Miros, your Matt Hardys. You brought in some people from New Japan. Well, you brought in Lance Archer from New Japan, and it didn't. None of it is working. None of it is working. I don't. I don't know what to tell you. Anyway, Dustin was asked about his uh, the, the recruitment of the Dark Order. He says no, and then he says that he's going to destroy the Dark Order one person at a time, and that Evil Uno is next. See, Dark Order is still heels. Well, Evil Uno is a heel. Does he know that those other two guys are being are playing tricksters and riding hobby horse Hangman Page? Why? Why is he not stopping that? Why is he letting that go on? Why is Brody Lee not stopping it? Shouldn't Brody Lee like drown Adam, you know, John Silver and Alex Reynolds and beat them half to death because they, you know, they're out there acting goofy? Guess not. So the third match on the show was best friends top flight in the varsity blondes versus the inner circle in a 12 man tag. I noticed that Brandon Cutler was taken out of this match. I wonder why is it had, cause he had smart marks for Jim Ross and therefore he got taken out of this match. I also give credit to Darby Allen for actually agreeing with Jim Ross. Uh, I was going to talk about that later, but I might as well talk about it here. Um, I think that Darby Allen, you know, he also said that there, he feels like a lot of people, uh, their hearts are not in it. Uh, he, I was like, he's in a, I don't know if he's in a position to make these comments, but I appreciate it. You know, it's, it's the only time you really get any real shit is if somebody from actually from AEW says it, like you never get it from the dirt sheets. Like what backstage, like in AEW, you don't hear nothing about it. Even though you hear that this man is, you know, throwing a fit and turning Titan tower upside down and throwing it into the Atlantic ocean every Monday. You never hear anything. It's always smooth sailing in AEW. And then Jim Ross would make a comment and then it'll quickly go away. But this one didn't because Brandon Cutler fed in. He got it removed from this match. And I was like, yay. Because it was very nice seeing Pillman Jr. in there with Jericho. That was so nice. Like, it, it like, cause I like Pillman Jr. I like him as a, I watched um, some shoot interviews of his. He's a really good kid. He was in a real bad position. You know, he's he's kind of in over his head because, you know, so many people like his dad. He's He wants to succeed. He's still pretty young. And people are out there trying to give him opportunities, trying to give him chances. He's also kind of, I don't want to say trapped into that MLW contract, but he is. I mean, if we're being honest, they wouldn't let him go. <laughs> but, you know, um, when the varsity blind sucks, but, you know, it's it's a job. You know, and maybe if he could actually get under contract, it'd actually be something different for him. But it was nice seeing him in the ring with Jericho. You know, Jericho was willing to debunk for him and do some stuff for him to actually work with him. That was real nice shit. You know, to me, this was heartwarming. I like heartwarming stuff. You know, not romantic comedies, but I like I like heartwarming stuff. Uh, Orange Cassidy was on quote unquote commentary, which means he just sat there and acted like he had to piss for 12 minutes or whatever. Uh, the first time, this was the first time Santana and Ortiz had been in the same ring with best friends since the parking lot fight. I'm glad they went back to that. I actually like continuity. Um, they went into this, uh, they went into this 12 person brawl, which, uh, I, I've completely lost count of who was the legal person and who, what was going on at any, any point in time in this. Uh, then they did a six way hug, which I make me want to Earl. Made me just absolutely disgusting. Jericho then hits Griff Garrison, the most creative wrestler looking motherfucker on the planet, in the back with a baseball bat. Hager did a shitty F5. Quite frankly, one of the shittiest F5s I've ever seen, if not the shittiest F5 I've ever seen. He's a lazy fuck. He's another Kevin Nash. And then MJF tagged himself in to get the pin. Post match, top flight drop kicks Jericho. And I believe it was MJF for Jericho and Hager. And. Basically bumped those guys, and <clears throat> later on in the night, they would challenge them to a match. They would challenge MJF and Jericho to a tag team match, and you know what? Their promo was not that bad. Uh, Darius and, oh, I forget the other kid's name, 
uh, I don't know. I just didn't want to call him Michael, <laughs> but it was a D, it had some kind of D. Uh, but I, all I know is one of them was uh, Airwolf. He did the talking, and his, his promo was not that bad. He said, you know, that MJF was the hottest young talent until they signed, but not at top flight. You know, they want some more Jericho and MJF, and they're going to give them the rub. Okay, cool. They're giving top flight a chance here. They need to teach them how to fucking work and not just do acrobatics. And maybe, maybe working with Jericho, they may learn something. Maybe, hopefully. Hopefully, Jericho grabs one of these motherfuckers and whispers to him, hey, put me in a, put me in a chin lock. <laughs> put me in an arm bar. Arm bar. <laughs> Move to headlock. You know, lock up, do something different. Um, but they weren't too bad. Um, top flight, you know, at least they're trying to give them a chance, man. I'm, I'm not going to begrudge people for giving people chances, you know? So we also get a Thunder Rosa promo. It was really bad. She was really cringy. Um, she, I, I think she's English second language, but she was talking about how she belongs in AEW and that Britt Baker thinks she doesn't belong in AEW and she's traveled all over the world and Britt Baker stuck her big nose in her title match. And then Reba approached. And said she shouldn't talk about Britt Baker like that. And then Britt Baker attacked Thunder Rosa from behind and put her in the in the rings of Saturn. And then says, Oh, I think she said that Thunder Rosa was so ugly she broke the camera. I, I hope she didn't say that. That would have been really bad. Then we get something that I felt like I was transported to another planet. And it was a planet of boiling blood. Because SCU, Frankie Kazarian, and Christopher Daniels wrestled the acclaimed. Matt Caster and Anthony Bowens. And the acclaimed are the rap guys. So one of them guys come out with a boombox, which I have not. I mean, did Tony Khan basically watch, you know, he must have watched Do the Right Thing, got inspired by Radio Raheem, and now he got this guy running around with a boombox. And the other one's got a microphone. And he's rapping. And I'm not even going to try to imitate the raps. I'm just going to poke out the, what he rapped about. He rapped about Kazarian having hair plugs. He rapped about him carrying Daniels. He rapped. He says SCU about to look like victims of SVU. And I was like, okay, that actually wasn't too bad. That was a, it was an opening line too. It wasn't that bad. And then it got cringier than ever because Kazarian gave me the started rapping, and he gave me the old rap crap rhyme. And it's like, man, how many times are we going to get this rapper's crap, rapper's crap? And then he says, are you the acclaimed or are you men on a mission? He, <laughs> I was like, oh, no. Oh, no. If you thought, if you thought AEW was different from WWE, you're wrong. You're wrong, buddy. Bad booking decisions. Out of touch, out of date gimmicks. This dude is carrying around a boom box, which most people within your 18 to 34 demographic ain't never fucking seen. Ask a 20 year old what a fucking boom box is. They couldn't tell you. They, they don't even know what a disc man is. How, why you got this guy running around with a boom box? Come on, man. They use the boom box as a weapon. That was the only reason for them to have it. And. He, Bone was pinned Daniels with some move. I don't care. It was it was a nothing match. It didn't really mean anything. Frankie Christopher Daniels is a little too old to be in these matches. They don't want to beat Scorpio Sky, so whatever. But this is the dynamite debut of the acclaimed. And of course, because it was their debut, they get to challenge the champions. So they get back on the microphone and they're gonna rap again. And I was just kinda I just put my head in my hands and I said, I can't believe they're gonna let them rap again. So then they diss the Young Bucks, saying they want the tag titles, and they act like menstruating women, which I absolutely agree. I don't think there, I don't think there's ever been truer rack lyrics than that. Then when they mention that the Young Bucks act like hoes, you know, I don't think there's ever been truer words spit in a rap song, and people have said like, you know, some real shit. So, of course, the Young Bucks accept the challenge because, you know, they're they're looking for weak opponents. <sighs> then we get Ivelisse and Diamante versus Big Swole and Serena Deeb. Uh, Big Swole tapped out Diamante with the Cloverleaf. 
Uh, Nyla Rose attacked uh, post match, attacked Swole and Deeb, and then Red Velvet hit Nyla Rose with a chair. And I couldn't tell you what happened in this match. I didn't. I, I, my brain shut off. I was. I was. <laughs> I was burnt by this point. I was burnt out by this point. Um, it was nice seeing Red Velvet though. She's kind of cute. Uh, but Ivelisse and Diamante, didn't they win that women's tag team tournament thing? They're like the tag team champions, essentially. Why would they lose into a makeshift team of Big Swole and Serena D? Whatever. None, none matters. Nothing matters to show. Uh, so, uh, Best Friends said that they that Miro sabotaged Orange Cassidy. And the Best Friends said, that, oh, they're going to be at the Holiday Bash event. And that they're going to plan to sabotage the event, of course, because... Miro sabotaged Orange Cassidy. So we didn't get a Jurassic Express vignette. And then FTR got on the mic and yelled into the headsets that they don't understand why there's going to be vignettes for the, for the Jurassic Express. You know, it's a fake Tarzan and a dinosaur. And that they, and that, you know, if they wanted to know if tag team wrestling was dead in, uh, in AEW, because the number one tag team in the world it's not on the show and not booked and they're not doing anything. And then Dax Harwood got on this, got on the microphone and cut an impassioned promo about how that's, this is how he feeds his family. And, you know, they're the best in the world. And I like that, you know, I've been loving the FTR promos. They've actually been pretty good. Um, especially Dax. Dax is getting really good at cutting promos. He's really good. So then we get into our main events. <laughs> Which is unfortunately Kenny Omega versus Joey Janela. And oh boy. So uh Don Cows was on commentary the entire time, yelling through the mic, you know, give basically saying what Kenny Omega was doing. Um the interesting thing was Ken Joey Janela sat in the chair and then the Tope Con Hero or the Terminator dive that Don Callis called it happened on the uh on on the chair. So he Basically, did a toe pay on a guy who was sitting down. You also let uh, Jelly Janela uh, leg drop Kenny Omega through a chair, through a table. I mean, um, I do like the nice touch of when Kenny, when when uh, Joey Janela was in control. Don Callis was not talking; he was instead being concerned. So, I also tried to treat Kenny Omega like he was the Rock. Like he's going to do commentary for his own matches, but he didn't have anything to say. He was just, you know, being a goof. And it was, it was really, it was all awkward. It was all weird. I don't understand why your world champion is in a no disqualification match with some guy other than because Joey Janela can't have any other kind of match. This literally is his career is doing garbage matches. And people say, Oh, you shouldn't sign this guy. And then AEW ran interference for him. They smoke screened and, Oh, Joey Janela is going to be good for the brand. And this is what they do with him. He put him in the, I don't understand why he was in the main event. This should have been the first fucking match. It was, it was stupid. It's a stupid match. And Joey, and obviously Omega wins with the one winged angel. Who cares? So death triangle came out and I was surprised to see this. I thought Pac was going to challenge uh, Omega for the title, which would have been cool. You know, Pac admitted that they had unfinished business. But that Phoenix never lost in the tournament. He was replaced by Penta, by the way. And that he should be considered a top contender or the top contender. And then Don Callis was like, nope, you're a wrestler. Wrestlers don't make matches. They certainly don't tell the champ what to do. And then Pac says, well, they already talked to Tony Khan. And so December the 30th, Phoenix versus Omega will be for the title. So this is the same reason that he had a match with Joey Janela. That Joey Janela basically was eliminated from the tournament without actually losing. So they're actually plugging up these holes in their tournament, which is, is fine. Of course, this doesn't mean anything for me. Now, people on the internet <clears throat> may be super excited about Phoenix and Omega. And I'm saying to myself, I do believe we've seen this before. And uh, But also, do you really believe that Phoenix is going to win? Like, at some point, good match is not enough. There needs to be some drama. There needs to be some something on the line other than the title. Like you need to put some, there needs to be some real stakes because we know that Kenny Omega is freshly the champion and you're doing all this crossover stuff, which almost none of it was mentioned tonight. There's never, there's no, there was no impact 
Uh, anybody from Impact, nobody showed up. Nobody from AEW seems to be upset about, you know, the whole Impact crossover. Uh, nobody from, <laughs> they don't seem to care. Nobody from Impact cares either. It's like the crossover is happening on a, on another plane of existence and everybody else is kind of like, oh, well, you know, nobody was like, well, since these guys are crossing over, well, we cross over, you know, nothing like that. Um, but they need to do something, I guess, you know, and Omega versus Phoenix should be fine. It should be a good match, but there, you know, there's nothing that says that Phoenix is going to win. Phoenix is a low man on the totem pole. He has no momentum. So there, why would anybody believe that Phoenix is going to win? There's zero momentum there. It's only it's sheer spectacle of they're going to have a match, and it's like okay, whoop de do. But that is my AEW Dynamite review. Thank you guys. Um, if you like what I do, please hit me up with a dollar. If you like what I do, follow me on Twitter at Mongo Slate Eight. Also. Hit the like and the subscribe on the channel. Um, I appreciate you guys. Thank you guys for listening. Um, and I'll talk to you guys later.